friends, it's almost midnight, and you've found your way to the Pikecast. Come along as we careen through the catalog of the most formative horror writer of our young adult days, Christopher Pike. From adult perspectives, we'll revisit these YA books our parents probably would never have let us read had they known what lie inside. We tackle one book per episode in a freewheeling and unbiased chat. So grab your battered paperback, pull the flashlight from the kitchen drawer, climb under your bed covers, and devour a good book with us. Greetings, fellow pikers, and welcome to the PikeCast. Today, we're digging into Christopher Pike's 1988 book, Spellbound, and we're going to be dissecting it in great detail, spoiling each and every plot twist, so consider yourself warned. Today is a little bit different. Cooper's not going to be joining us for this episode, so it's just me and my amazing co-host. Hi, I'm Becca. If you're enjoying the PikeCast, please leave us a review on the podcast service of your choice. And welcome to our guest piker this week, Andrew, host of Friday the 13th Horror Podcast. Hello. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you guys? We're good. Thank you for coming. Of course. Thank you so much for having me on. So um, we're going to get right into things here. Tell us a little bit about how you discovered Christopher Pike. Oh, gosh. Um, Probably by way of R.L. Stein a little bit <clears throat> um, and kind of perusing my local B. Dalton bookstore in the uh, in the mall. Um, I, I think that I was drawn to these books because they were in the same section, but also kind of the um, elaborate bright colors that kind of they use for all of their their bookends. You know, yes. specifically this one is like a bright blue with like pink letters. And I think it just kind of drew my eye in and uh, once I kind of read one and I was like, oh my gosh, people actually die in these books. <laughs> like <laughs> I, I was kind of just drawn in and I, I had probably close to 30 of these books at one point. Um, but I sold them in a garage sale for the most part when I was a kid, I was so dumb. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I would have kept them, but I still have two left over. I'm not sure why it's these two. Um, and you guys will be delighted that the other one is the midnight club. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and Spellbound. And these are the two that I've held on to all these years. And uh, it was fun to go back and uh, reread it. Uh, there was a lot of things I had forgotten. So it was fun to dive back in. So when you you held on to these two, was it a choice or did you just happen like these are just the two that randomly ended up staying in your or were you like, these are the two I need to keep? I always loved Spellbound. Like that was one of my favorites. Um, and I really liked Midnight Club, too. Uh, I'm not sure why I held on to these two, to be totally <laughs> honest. But um, these are the two that survived, I guess. Um, yeah. I mean, it worked out because you needed this one for the episode and then Midnight exactly. Club's coming to Netflix later. So you're prepared. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Um, this is actually my first ever Christopher Pike book that I read too. Um, oh, wow. so yeah. And this is the first time I've read it since I was probably like 18 or 19 now. So it was, it was fun to revisit <laughs> an old yeah. classic. I was a little worried because, um, just with everything going on, I didn't start reading it until last week and I was like, am I going to be able to get through this? But I forgot how, um, what's the word I want to look for? How like easy it was to read a pike book like it just flows so quick and he just gets right through it and i was just like within three settings i think i was done with this book so yeah i i love that about them too because i'm so i'm a marathon reader and i'll like i started this book at 10 a.m this morning oh wow <laughs> yeah i usually and i do that every time we have a podcast too because i like i like it being really fresh in my brain right before the recording um and i I'm found like I find the same thing like I can just read it and go flipping pages flipping pages because there's just constant stuff happening there's never really like a long drawn out boring phase or anything yeah it's kind of the opposite of the Stephen King effect like where he likes to go into <laughs> excruciating detail in every little piece this is like um, Christopher Pike is basically like here is your character here's their description and here we go let's go <laughs> yeah it's all the fun and none of the none of the you know the thick substance <laughs> yeah <laughs> And don't get me wrong, I've read almost all of Stephen King's books, but it's just yeah. a different style, you know? It is. It is. It's definitely more compulsively readable, I think, too. If It's like a more of beach read type thing instead yeah. of like yeah. cozy at home by the fireplace. So what is the thing that keeps Christopher Pike on your mind after all these years? I think the lasting effect of Christopher Pike on me was just like the visceralness of some of his books. Like if for a young adult novels or I guess books, how would I don't know how, how you'd classify these, but um, 
they just pull no punches. And you don't really get that in some of the modern, you know, young adult books. I mean, the only one I can think of that you know, of modern day are the kind of like Hunger Games books, but they didn't even exploit the violence like Christopher Pike did, you know, and being a kid that was already into horror movies and, you know, watched them from a very young age with my grandma and my mother. um, This was like the book version of that. And it just lasted with me. And um, yeah, it it just, it kept kept me coming back for more. (laughs) I love that. I think that that's a common thread between a lot of us who have read them when we were younger. It was so different from the other stuff that we were reading because everything else is a little bit more PG or G rated, Mm -hmm. even if it was kind of spooky. So having sex and people like actually dying in terrible ways, like that was pretty cool. Yeah, I I can distinctly remember. (laughs) (laughs) I can distinctly remember when I read The Midnight Club and, you know, you guys have already covered that book, so I won't spend too much on it. But when your main character dies at the end, you're just like, wait. Did that just happen? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a uh, welcome to our first episode too. Because uh, when we did, what was the first one called? Die Softly. Yeah, uh, Becca. This is so Becca never read any Pike books before when when she was younger, and so coming to the podcast, this is her first time for everyone. And after that first one, she was like, "Wait, <laughs> <laughs> there is a lot of cocaine." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think that's really cool um, because it, it, the stakes are high, and you don't know who's going to die. Like your main character could be dead by the end of the book, and it's just. Got to see where it goes. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so um, I know you mentioned Spellbound and then The Midnight Club. So what are some of your other favorite of Pike books that you can remember? I mean, obviously, you know, the big one that I think everyone mentions is Monster. That's like kind of, (laughs) it's like entryway drug into Christopher Pike, you know. (laughs) Um, I never, and then, you know, after that, you know, Die Softly obviously is is a fine one. Bury Me Deep, I remember pretty good. And then what are the ones, did he, he wrote a series called, I think, Friends Till the End. Is that? Uh, The Final Friends one. Final Friends, that's what it is, um, that I really got into. Um, But yeah, those are kind of the ones that's come out, uh, you know, fresh in my mind. Yeah. Yeah. Those are good. I don't think we've actually covered any of the final friends ones, but um, I think we have the first one maybe scheduled. Um, And I'm excited for that too. Cause I remember it, there were a couple of like trilogies, like remember me and the final uh-huh. friends and having those, those stories continue on through the different books is kind of different and fun from the other ones. I, I'm just now realizing I said friends till the end, because that was the series of short stories that I wrote <laughs> oh <laughs> in, <my God. laughs> in kind of the uh, style of Christopher Pike. So, so I, no, I love that though. That's, <laughs> that's I instantly kind of thought about child's for. play. So did I. Yeah. I was thinking of Chucky too. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay. Please so not. let me go down. So Becca, you are going to read the back of the book for us today. Yes. Are you ready for this? I am ready. (laughs) All right. (laughs) All right. No one knew how the girl had died. They found Karen Holly in the mountain stream, her skull crushed. There was only one witness to the tragedy, Karen's boyfriend, Jason Whitfield. He said a grizzly had killed her, but a lot of people didn't believe him. They thought Jason had murdered her in a fit of rage. And now weeks have passed, and Jason has another girlfriend, Cindy Jones. And there are the new kids in town. Joni Harper, the quiet English beauty that Cindy's brother Alex cannot get out of his mind, and Bala, the foreign exchange student from Africa, the grandson of a powerful shaman. Together, they will return to the place where Karen was killed. Some will die. The others will come face to face with the horror beyond imagining. Do you, Okay, so <laughs> Bala, is that what we're going with? I think so. Yeah, I was yeah. going to ask okay. you guys. Yeah, okay, cool. Okay. Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, yeah, sorry. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I re- um, when I read the when I picked this book back up and I read the back, I was like, "What? How many characters can you get into like one description?" Right? You know? Yes, there were so many in there, like first and last name too. I'm like, I can't keep these people straight. <laughs> I've got um my I think the copy of the book that I have um so I have two. One of them I got because the this one is ripped up, but I didn't want to read the nice one. And this one, I had two kittens at one point that kind of used it for like teething. And I know. And so the back of my cover has like these little puncture holes through some of the words. And it looks so atmospheric because there's talons on the back of this particular cover I have too. Um, And so I thought that was really cool. And I liked it. Yeah. Spoiler. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Spoiler. um, Sorry, we're moving on to the artwork, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I screwed up. I didn't art. The title of this section is Magic Fire. Sorry, Cooper. <laughs> Cooper's going to listen to this and be like, what kind of fucking hot mess He's is like, this He's like, I'm shit? never leaving you guys alone again. 
He's <laughs> just going to insert his own <laughs> I know, voice I know. It. We, We're here for it. He's got the good podcast voice. <laughs> right. We're well, just um, <laughs> Yeah, we are. Speaking of the artwork, though, um, so do you have the cover with the vulture on it? I don't. I have a cover where it looks like maybe Karen and Jason, and there's a shadow, like, over them. Yeah, okay. you, so you have the one where they're crouched down with his, like, traditional Christopher Pike font on top, right? Yes, yeah. Okay, yes. That's the one, yeah, that's what I have, too. But, like, when I was looking up the covers, like, there was one with the vulture, and I was like, that is, like, major spoiler right, right. there. <laughs> yeah, well, so the one that – so I have the two. I, I do have the same one that you guys have, and that's the one we'll go into probably more. But I have the other one that I call, like, the 90s metal cover because he oh, has yeah. these, you know, with, like, the weird font. And, like, this one has, like, a girl with one eye and then, like, this screaming skull. And then on the back there is a full-ass – vulture with like two people and like it's it's so spoilery <laughs> like, it tells yeah. you everything on this other cover i'm like what the heck is this i think it's so, funny okay. on on my cover there's a subtitle that says um you can close your eyes it won't help but i'm like that's <laughs> literally what happens and it, it did. does help so i don't know <laughs> I didn't even think about that, but you're right. And that's actually the same tagline is on both of my, like both covers. That's so funny. I know. Okay. So what do we think? Do we think this cover, I mean, I, the, we'll go with the, the colorful with the two people crouching. Do we think that's pretty accurate or what do we think? Yeah, I think so. Basic. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was just going to go on about how it's kind of basic, but oh. we can go here. both accurate instead. and basic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's true. It could be accurate and basic at the same time. I don't know who those people could be because when she goes up, I mean, it, there's like groups of people that go up together. And then when it when it isn't, it's usually not just, you know, a girl and a guy, right? Because it was two girls that go up. Like Joni goes up with um, Cindy at the end. Maybe it's, I don't know who they could be scared of over there. I really don't know. Yeah, I took it as Karen and Jason, like the initial attack. Oh, from the beginning. Yeah, the that's kind of how I put it, but. All right, I think I'm, gonna, right. I'm gonna go with that too. I think it so too. Sense. Is that the bear then? The quote unquote bear yeah. sneaking up on them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think we 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 agree that it matches, and we think the back matches too. Although a lot of name dropping, a little convoluted, <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, a little bit, yeah. And I think, um, but I mean, if you read this and you look at the front, you're like, okay, I got the gist. I got the gist. Unlike some of the other ones we've read, where we're like, this does not have anything to do with what we've actually read. Right. <laughs> Or they put the wrong names in it. Yeah, we I didn't notice that in this one, so that's good. Um, well, I, think, okay. I think it was pretty good this time. <laughs> <laughs> let's head into the Midnight Club, and we'll actually talk about these people. So let's start with Cindy Jones, our mainish character. I mean, I think I'll take a, a quote from Becca and just say she's kind of basic. <laughs> <laughs> You're not wrong. <laughs> not at all. I'm glad you said it instead this time. <laughs> Yeah, I, I wish she was a little bit more sassy because some of our yeah. other like heroines are usually really sassy and sarcastic and she didn't have a lot of that. Yeah, it, it kind of floats around um, between um, Alex and Cindy as the main characters. So it's not like super clear who the real main character is. It's kind of this brother sister team um, yeah. because we have we have total chapters where it's devoted to what's inside Alex's head. You know what I mean? It's true. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's true. That was like the first time they've done that for us so far, right? Where it was like alternating perspectives so far from what we've read, like on the podcast. I don't know about anything else. Yeah, I think normally we get um, we get multiple characters and like a little bit of snippet from different perspective, but it's not usually like like Cooper has said in the past. It's like they just split one main character into two, whereas this is like they each have their own kind of stories going mm -hmm. along. So I do think that this is the first time that we've read this done so well. Yeah, I wish that we just got some more out of Cindy. She just it doesn't she just doesn't do much to be honest. Right. <laughs> like and um I don't know if you guys had ever seen this before, but I had no idea what a song team was. No, Maybe is that are those cheerleaders? I'm guessing that that's what that is, but then in the in the book they say that they don't really participate in the halftime show and I'm like well, isn't that usually what the cheerleaders do? So I was very confused on what a song team was. It is, yeah, because then they mentioned they have pom poms and they shake their butts. Yeah, <laughs> and I was like, that doesn't sound like singing. <laughs> yeah, and they sexily eat hot dogs. <laughs> yeah, that right. part got me. I loved that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I have that highlighted as one of the worst lines in the book. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> I was like, is she serious? Right? Maybe now? I should save that for the cringe part. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So um, I think she, I think she's really basic too. I I. 
she made a lot of poor judgment calls. Like, it's like, why are you doing this? Like, you didn't think this through at all. Like, she knows the guy was like accused or whatever of killing his girlfriend. She's like, yeah, this is a great guy to go out with on a date right. and go. Yeah, like two thing. weeks after. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What the heck is that? Like red flag. Hello. I know. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and then he basically he gets her alone for the first time and basically tries to almost like rape her essentially. Oh I'm just like, awful. Can, yeah. can you just like move on? Go be with Bala. You obviously have like the, you know, huge hots for him. So just go right. for it. Yeah, yeah, she said he sounded like an African king, and I'm like, okay, babe. Yeah. Like, <laughs> he sounds pretty perfect to me. Right? I think we could all use that in our lives. <laughs> Agreed. Right. Yeah. Polite, like, into consent. I'm there for it. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, I, so do we talk about Alex and Cindy then, do you think? Or can we go on? Or do you want to talk more about Alex? Um, He's what? a little less basic, I think. <laughs> yeah, he has a little bit more to him. I mean, he's definitely, like, driven by his boner, let's be honest here. <laughs> but... <laughs> Has, and that's another has he never had a boner for a girl like what is it like i get this girl's like she's got some kind of like power over people but it just the way he acted i was like come on is this the first girl you've ever had an interest in or the first person you've ever like been attracted to that you're acting this way it's a little it was a little like 13 yeah. year old to me mm-hmm. that's definitely the vibe i was getting from him yeah it was just like no matter how many times people tell him to stay away from Joni, like he just can't and i'm like come on dude like it's this book takes place like maybe over the course of a week like <laughs> like can you just like hold your horses like <laughs> okay so on to jason whitfield uh, and that's cindy's boyfriend and the prior boyfriend of karen holly mm-hmm. yeah your resident jock character yeah. um oh, what yeah. a douchebag <laughs> that's all yeah, i have to that's say trash like even awful. though we find yeah we find out he didn't like do the murdering but he's still a little shit. He's still a coward. Right. And then you would think too, like if you're in a situation where something is killing your girlfriend and you're like, oh, I'm not safe here, and you run, <laughs> you'd go for help. You'd tell people the truth and be like, something's up there killing her. He's like, oh, uh, I, I don't know, might have been a bear. I think. Uh, <laughs> what, dude? Yeah. Like. <laughs> Why does he get so weirdly specific? Like, he's like, yes, there was a grizzly and it got her and then it punched me and I fell and I have a head wound. And it's just like, but dude, you could have just been like, I was walking, I we got in a fight and I was headed back to the car and we I heard her get attacked. I don't know what it was, but there's something out there, you know? Yeah. I can't like, forget that he also hits the quote unquote grizzly bear with the stick. Yeah, he has to show it, yeah. that he's like manly, you know? <laughs> He's ridiculous. He's like a caricature of like just jock yeah. muscle man douchiness with his little motorcycle. <laughs> yeah, I know. So suffice it to say we're not a fan. No. <laughs> Good old Jason. No. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> let's uh let's go on to Pam Alta. Oh, Pam God. is our, <laughs> our stereotypical chunky girl in the book. I was really worried that they were going to call her by her full name the entire book. And I was just like, this is, this sounds like, she sounds like an android, like a Star Trek character, Pam Alta. She (laughs) does. She's so futuristic. I kind of love it. (laughs) She's definitely like my, she's probably my favorite character in the book because she does have a little bit more personality to her, but she's just not. I don't know. I feel like in other Pike books, we get this kind of character, but with like more sass and like more, um, I don't know, that they're just smarter. And I think Pam is just kind of like, I don't know, she's like wheat toast instead of white toast. You know what I mean? <laughs> Boring. <laughs> but yeah, no, I definitely agree with you. And I think it's interesting too, because this is, this book is from 88. So it is one of his earlier books. And so these similarities that we're noting from this one and the characters to his other books, I think it's cool that we get to see he improves upon these stereotypes right. and these characters that he built. And I was like, hmm, she wasn't quite as fleshed out as I maybe would have liked, but she did have that chunky backside. So I'm going to keep that little bit for the next character. <laughs> I did like how she basically every, every scene that Ray was in, she basically told him to drop dead every time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She didn't, she didn't fuck around with politeness too. She's just like, if I don't like you, I don't like you. And I, I respected that. I, I will, I will say she had some spots where it, it seemed a little, racist like a couple of her comments mm. um like there was one where she was like oh i didn't know i didn't know this the dog could speak like bush language or something like that because bala whistles to him and he responds and i was like pam yeah that's not a good look like what the fuck are you <laughs> saying right there there's, there's um, a couple parts because this is 88 there yes, is yes. some stuff that 
I don't think that a white author would write about. Um, I didn't look into too many of the details with Bala and kind of the, some of the stuff that he gives as like uh, why his name is the way he is and the shamanism and like that kind of stuff. I'm hoping that he did some research into um, kind of that aspect of the character, uh, but it definitely reads like, oh, yep, this is definitely 88. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it was it was the very that magical black guy trope where like the green mile and things like that, which obviously, you know, in recent media, people go away from that and it's getting called out and stuff. But it, this is a product of its time. So we for can save sure. that for the problematic section, though. Let's go on to Joni Harper, our little dark haired, raven, innocent beauty. This is so th- like I said, it's been um many years since I've picked this book up, but I distinctly remember in when I first read it that I was surprised that Joni was the, the, you know, the, the adversary at the end and reading it this time, I was like, Andrew, it is like plainly spoken yes. that she is the bad guy from like the beginning. Like what were you thinking? Yes. I had the same exact experience. The first time I read it, I was like, no, she's, she's so sweet and pretty. What? <laughs> And this time, the whole time, I'm like, obviously, she's the murderer. There's something right. wrong with this girl. She's not right. <laughs> I mean, that's my first time. Um, I It went over my – well, everything goes over my head. But, like, it definitely went over my head that she was the villain. And that says, like, a 30-year-old woman. So, like, I feel like you guys are fine as kids. Yeah. And so, <laughs> you were, that, I, I want to hear your perspective then. So when it revealed that it was her at the end, what did you – were you like, oh, my God? So, okay, um, at some point, like, she did seem suspicious, like, when she was like, I'm sick, or I guess, like, her aunt, or whoever was going on about her being sick, like, that kind of, like, gave me a red flag, but, I mean, I just, I don't know, I really just, like, as usual, blame Jason the entire time, like I usually do, <laughs> so, it's like, the person they tell me is bad, I'm just like, okay, they're bad. Well, to so. be fair, toxic masculinity. <laughs> so. Yeah, and he was bad, just in a non-murdery way, at least right. by that point. Maybe in a few years, we'll see what happens to him. Yeah, yeah. Joni I don't see him did. going to college <laughs> and getting away with know. all the stuff that he's going to do. <laughs> but Johnny gave me, like, major, like, Megan Fox and Jennifer's body vibes, but a little bit less sexy, if that makes sense. Yeah, I can totally see that. You yeah. know, yeah. kind of that a vixen type, but she doesn't... Mm-hmm. She doesn't play up, like, her sexiness. It's almost like she plays up, like, that she's the good girl. Right. So it's, like, opposite but the same at the same time. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Loves it. I love when I get to read a Pike book and compare it to a horror movie. (laughs) It's, like, my favorite thing. (laughs) If I was, like, for, like, the Joni character, if I was going to cast someone um, now to play that character, I would probably pick um, the girl who plays Veronica on Riverdale. Like, I kind of see that, that kind of a character. I love it. Yes. I feel like her, she seems, she seems too like clever, like too smart. Like there's something in her face that's just too clever that I, that I feel like Joni has more of like this blank. I don't know. I don't want to say innocence because obviously she's not innocence, but stoic sort of like, whereas when I look at the girl who plays Veronica, she's like always smirking and I'm like, oh, you're so sassy girl. You're so sassy. You know what I mean? Like, but, but I do, I do think like the hair and the look and everything like that, like I can see that too. Like I just I see am. her like wearing like a, like a pearl necklace and like very dainty yeah. and like, you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 I like it. Um, I think so we can mention to her, um, her aunt, which was very strange. And I didn't remember her aunt, Mrs. Lee from when I read it as a kid. And so, um, I don't know, Becca, I think you are, but I don't know if you guys, have like read or watched like the Harry Potter books, but there's like a scene where there's an old lady who has spoiler, but she's like taken over by some other thing. And this gave me that vibe. So I thought Mrs. Lee was going to be like a creature being controlled by Joni or something. Like she didn't seem right. And I was like, are they in the same place at the same time? Like, are they ever in the room together? Like what's happening here? She was just so weird to me. (laughs) Yeah. I was getting like major, um, what, what is the, the person that like takes care of Dracula? You know what I mean? Like they're, um oh, like familiar like they're familiar yeah. like i was getting those kind of vibes because she was always making excuses for her um but oh. she wasn't nearly as sinister as what i thought she was going to be yeah she seemed a lot more scared i think let's talk about bala well african king <laughs> 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 love to see it he seemed like a very nice boy loved him yeah he's yeah, very yeah. polite like yes. it, it was like I don't know. It, he seemed like the um, the person you'd want to take home to mom type of guy. Oh, yes. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he obviously has like 
I don't want to say powers, but he has influence from the animals that he's traded with. So I was hoping they would go a little bit more into that, but they kind of just illustrate it in his actions. Um, but yeah, I mean, he's a solid guy. I was really disappointed and, you know, we'll get to the end, but I was a little disappointed in the end what happens with him. Um, but yeah, I, I think that I just always look for like that bow tie ending and this movie, or sorry, this book doesn't really have that. Uh, yeah, it's kind of just like a, it's kind of an ending of like an ellipsis, you know, it's just like dot, 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 and we're done. You know, yeah. I was surprised there was yeah. never a Spellbound 2 or something that spin off from this. Yes, it, I really feel like there could have been because he has a lot of like different um, he'll put different religions and different like customs and different things like that in his books. And you'll see some of them recur. But I this is one specific thing that I was like, I wish I could have read more about like learning more about that or even just like if he was. I don't know, pulling from something, if he did research or if he was just like winging it. I don't mm-hmm. know, but I thought it was really interesting. Yeah, I could definitely see a spinoff book of Bala back in Africa, kind of like dealing with the shaman, you know, uh, undertones and kind of battling the evils in Africa. And I, I could definitely see that as a spinoff. Yes, I think it would have been cool too to to have some sort of like prequel thing where it was like, the, I know he told the story of what happened with her in Africa and like how she changed into the vulture and everything. But I think that would have been like a cool story to just be in, like having that happen as our story not being told to us. I really like that. It was definitely came out of left field when I first read this. I was like, wait, what? Like She <laughs> is like traded with a vulture. The story, and we'll get to it when we get to the plot, but the story of how she gets turned into this thing is just awful. <laughs> it's wild. Yeah, it's pretty wild. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's talk about Ray Bauer, who is another basic. I don't I don't know. He's just like that friend that needed to die. <laughs> <Really>. <laughs> he was there for the body count. <laughs> yeah. I just he his character is I don't know. I feel like even though it might be seen as like a basic character, I feel like I knew someone like Ray in high school. Yes. Like you know what I, I mean. Agree with that. He is like the resident jokester. He he pulls some of the it, it borders on inappropriate to be honest, especially when he's teasing um oh, who's our main jock guy? I can't remember his name right. Jason. Jason. Um, when he teases him about Karen, I was like, "Whoa, dude! Like, slow your roll, Jesus." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he he I. He was a little bit inappropriate, and I, I definitely do think I've known people like him who have made jokes and just, like, waiting to see if people laugh. And like, oh, you guys just don't get it. I think I did have a little bit of respect for him in some parts because he was he, see, he seemed genuinely nice in some areas, whereas, um, for example, when him and Alex were racing and he beat Alex, Alex was in his head and he's like, oh, I, I don't have it in me to be nice. Like, I'm, I'm a sore loser, you know? And then when he beats Ray – Ray's like oh I guess I should have had more donuts I would have beat you this time you know like he was just he just went with it he was just a nice right. like fun and I like that I, I thought that was a good I feel like he a good tr- truly like cared about Alex whereas Alex was like well fuck Ray yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, like Ray like in the power of teammates wouldn't you want to like help Alex up and like you know he just kind of like is like okay I'm gonna take advantage of this opportunity and run past him even though he's got blood all over his knee and like yeah <laughs> It's like, Very sorry, true. guy, bye. <laughs> and he blatantly just goes behind Alex's back and goes on a date with Joni. Like, obviously, that leads to his death, but it's like, yeah, I get that he like says that he cares about Alex, but actions speak louder than words. That's my true. I will say though, he mentioned that he liked Joni, and Alex never told him not to. And if they had been like really good friends, he should have had the open communication to be like, no, like that would actually bother me, true, and been open true. about that, which. And and so he calls him out. And he's like, I I told you, you didn't tell me that it would bother you. Like, and he's like, Well, now I'm telling you. And it's like, oh, I'm, uh, yeah. Ta-da. Alex Alex lost his boner a little bit there. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't it seem though that when he does go out with Joni, like he's like, kind of like, I don't know the word I'm thinking of, like entranced by her like power because he was like, Did I you don't say know. that he's spellbound, Becca? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> no yeah I, I think that's I think that lure and that attraction and, and he even says that when he's talking to Alex he's like I don't I don't know why like she's just got this hold over me like nothing's gonna happen but I just have to go so I think that probably was trying to build up that she's the bad guy t- type of thing mm-hmm. so let's go into Kent Cook I'm gonna be honest I don't remember who Kent Cook is Becca <laughs> he's the reporter 
Oh, oh yeah. Okay. I mean, is he worth talking about? We don't have to. If you think it's worth mentioning. I, why? Why do you guys think he was in this? Why? Why did he exist? I think just to, like push the story. Like things aren't as it seems. Maybe. Yeah, yeah that's fair because he was the one creating all the suspicion and stuff. So he was kind of the catalyst for like, let's look closer at Jason. Right. He's not telling the truth. Yeah. Okay. I, I do think it's funny that he he doesn't really write like a journalist. He more writes like, "Dear Diary." This is right. why I think. <laughs> Jason killed Garrett. <laughs> it's really funny. I've noticed a lot of the articles that are in Christopher Pike books are not written. Like it's not even he didn't even try. Like right. they're all written like journal entries. <laughs> exactly. I was like, no one writes like this. Like this is not journalistic style. <laughs> like today I had eggs for breakfast. Oh, and also Jason killed her. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so if we, I mean, if you guys have anything, there were a couple of other minor characters: Karen Hawley, the girl who died, and then Mister Magnuson, who did some animal experimentation, animal, <laughs> yeah, cutting open bits and stuff. If you guys have anything to say about those two, yeah, why did he have to kill that poor hamster? Right. <laughs> Was there even a point to that, like at all? Because I like had forgotten him by the end of the book. I thought he was going to come back and like give some wise uh, discourse about vultures or something, but he just never does. And he just so, <laughs> he just likes to like poison hamsters and then cut them open. I'm just what is happening here? Yeah, like he shouldn't be a teacher. I feel like <laughs> right. I feel like he should have been the person giving me the scientific info dump that I hate so much. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Like, why couldn't he have been like? Uh, I looked at the coroner's report and it was uh, this kind of head smash. You know what I mean? <laughs> Oh, yeah. didn't they say too like they're part of the thing was like the coroner's report was just like we don't know which thing killed her it could have been either of them <laughs> no she would she could have even died from being hit in the head lightly right. <laughs> I was like what it you de- would definitely go into that <laughs> it definitely gave me the vibes i don't know if you guys ever watched this documentary you know this case but um the staircase no so it's this it's this guy and um he's suspected of killing his wife but Um, it's pretty much he found her at the bottom of the stairs and she was dead. That's what he says. And then there's this whole documentary series about like, could it have been him? Could it have been this? And then at the very end, they tack on this wild thing that they found owl feathers in her hair. So they think that maybe she was attacked and killed by an owl. What? It's, it's, look it up. This case is, I think that there's (laughs) a documentary series on Netflix if you really want to get into it, but it's bizarre. It's called The Staircase. Definitely I'm gonna be doing that tonight. Yeah, <laughs> it is. I love weird stuff. But then, like, when you start to look into it and you start to look at the evidence and everything, and sorry, this is a little off topic, but I'm just going oh, there <laughs> because it fascinates me. But um, <laughs> yeah, they're like, and then they introduce the owl, and you're like, huh? But then by the end, you're like, maybe it was an owl. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to watch that. <laughs> I'm so excited right now. Make me look at owls in a different way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> It just reminded me of this so much because they were like, yes, and this is how she, her head was crushed and she had, you know, V shapes and, you know, it's just interesting. Yeah. And they're like, it looks like she was, her, it was put between two hands and smushed. And I'm like, you guys told me that like three times now, but you're also saying it's a bear. Like, I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> And for how many times Joni says this won't hurt, it sure sounds like it's going to hurt. <laughs> right? They were screaming like the whole time. Yeah. I don't. It feels like being eaten alive. Well, that seems like that's what's happening. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's get into Remember Me. And we're going to do a little bit of plot discussion, which we've already talked a lot about it. But um, there's a lot that happens in this book. <laughs> yeah. For a, like a 215 page book, a lot happens. <laughs> The, the bit about having like the Africa stuff in here too, because sometimes in his books are a little bit more, mm, I don't want to say like metaphysical, well, yeah, metaphysical. And this one was a little bit, it, it had that sort of like spiritual, supernatural type of thing to it, but it was also like very real based. And he even says like, I was trying to be a man of science. Like I didn't want to believe any of this. I was ignoring all of this. And I'm kind of like, so we wouldn't have had a book if he had just listened to his grandfather in the very beginning, right? Mm-hmm. Like <laughs> he could have just prevented all these teens from dying. <laughs> Yeah, the whole story about the Africa, and <clears throat> it's just, it's so crazy. Like, I've never seen this explored in any other book. And I don't know, like we said earlier, if it's based on, like, factual information or if he just made it up. Um, but also, of all the animals to want to trade places with, why a vulture? Like, what does that give you in the end, even if you come back? 
it is really weird too, especially because they they he goes on to say how his grandfather was so experienced. He'd been doing this. He'd been helping people, teaching people. He just randomly is like, oh, there's vultures up there here. One of them come down and do this to this small girl. Like, right. why would you think that that's okay of all the creatures? And vultures are like the 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 bringers of death. Like, why would you even? It's so strange of all the animals, especially when you live in Africa, where there's literally the most species of animals, you know, that there is on a continent. And you choose this one to put this poor girl into? No wonder she freaks out. I know. And I just the idea of this as a thing, like, I feel like this can make a really cool movie because it's so horrific. Just like the idea of this girl being trapped in the mind of this vulture and going crazy. And then just the fact that she flies to her parents and they shoot her head off. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> that is so fucked up. It it's, was it's, wild. It, it, it just goes to show you, though, that Christopher Pike pulls no punches. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it reminds me of in the Midnight Club. It's it's obviously one of the but one of the stories that they talk about. When but when he saws that girl in half, and you're just like, what yes. the fuck? <laughs> You have like that shocked face and you're just like, wait, wait, did I read that correctly? Right, right. Like, what? In a teen book? Hang on. <laughs> I um, I thought it was interesting that there was – it felt like there were like two things happening. Like there was all this like teen drama and like, oh, my boyfriend this and my boyfriend that and I really hope he likes me. And oh, there's this other guy over here. I don't want to hold my boyfriend's hand anymore. And then this underlying like people are literally being ripped apart. <laughs> like why are you so concerned about whose hand you're holding? Somebody's going to die. Like, <laughs> I just, I don't know how these teens are able to compartmentalize these things so well, like being in so much danger. And then also like, I hope he likes the way my legs look in this dress. Right. <laughs> and like randomly going to the hospital and not telling your parents. I'm like, I don't think that that's a thing. <laughs> like, <laughs> No. And, and that's the thing that we talk about too. And a lot of his books is the parents are so absent from mm -hmm. everything that's going on because they have to be because how else would these you know teens get into these shenanigans but then when you apply that to like real life you cannot go to the hospital as a teen without your parents being called like you can't get seen and treated without somebody over 18 there to help like yeah, they don't let you do that keep in mind this is 1988 so what are they doing just giving them cash like what <laughs> Um, another oh, thing that I thought was interesting about the plot is that we divide, we devote so much time to cross country, oddly, <laughs> like, but it never, I, I was so assuming that we were going to come back to that and there was going to be like a chase scene at the end with yes. Joni and Alex and it was going to yes. all pay off that he's a cross country runner. And then, nope, he just goes off right. the falls and flies, apparently. Because <laughs> there's usually a reason for things to be in books, but this time he's just running cross country, living his life when he could have used that skill later in life. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I just, that was like a missed opportunity. I thought just right. devoting so much time to that sport and then it not paying off <laughs> in the end was just like, well, then I just it's kind of like running for exercise. Like what? No, I don't want to. <laughs> like, I'd rather sit down. Okay. <laughs> I think they mentioned too, he was running when his sister was in the, or not the ocean, but the lake and she's being carried down the river. He was running alongside the lake. Kind of like, I don't know, fast. I think yeah, but he still <laughs> maybe can't that do was anything. Like, no. <laughs> yeah. I, I no, I don't. And that is weird. Like there were so many times that I, there were several pages of running, like just running and like, he was getting close to the finish line. Oh, he was very winded. He had a cramp. And I'm like, I know what running's like. I don't like it. I don't like reading about it. Come on. I did we think like two, two different races. Like there was one at the beginning and then one like midway through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the fact that those um, girls trip him up in the first race and they don't get any repercussions for that. Right? I was like, don't you at least want to go yell at them or something? <laughs> like. Not only that, but who's in charge? Where are the coaches and teachers here telling these people what to do? Like, that's actually dangerous. Right. The girls could have been kicked in the head. Yeah. And that's the, like, not to, to be honest, I, I was on cross country for one year in high school and it is the stupidest sport ever. <laughs> <because> <laughs> you just run through like the woods and like, you know, around buildings. It's not like you have like a, you know, when you're in regular track, you're on the track and that's kind of, it's isolated to that area. This is like, oh, we just need to find three miles somewhere. So, you know, just figure it out. <laughs> Man, that is like. People have different ideas of fun, and that is not mine. Right. <laughs> I did think it was so funny that, like, 
it was the sport of cross country was held to like such a high esteem in this book uh, up to a point of it being compared to football, which anyone that grew up in a football town knows that football is going to be, you know, the big thing. Nobody goes to cross country meets to watch people run. Like it's just not a thing. <laughs> yeah. Why? I Do they get cheerleaders? Cause I've never been, do they, do they have cheerleaders or no? no is that not a thing? We didn't anyway. So- and it, I, I did think that it was interesting that they got it totally right it's with cross country you run it like in the mid afternoon like you don't really run at night or like you know prestige times it's kind of just like well there's a race going on at three o'clock in case anybody wants to go see it (laughs) i wonder if um so like we've mentioned before like with the um, scuba diving and photography and stuff i wonder if maybe christopher pike was just like into running in high school or something and that this is just something that he was like a part of him that he decided to just plug into the book because i can't figure out a reason for it in here like there's just no reason Mm -hmm. they could have been doing anything they could have been in drama class they could have been in like art class they could have had an after-school job at mcdonald's i don't know it didn't have to be this they did mention mcdonald's once they did yeah the off-campus mcdonald's that they (laughs) They, they, it was so funny. I, this is just reoccurring to me, but they say in the book that it's like a couple blocks away, but they drive there. I'm like, yep, this is typical teenagers. Like, can't walk anywhere. The McDonald's um, also had the dreaded milk mouth. Oh, that's what I was going to mention. The yes. milk. There were so many mentions of milk in this book. <laughs> As an adult, they only drink milk. Nobody drinks milk. Like, I don't know. know. Besides, like, disgusting. like five and under, like that's when people drink milk, not fourteen, fifteen, right. sixteen. Who <laughs> Just gets like, milk with their nuggies? Like, what the who hell? Gets milk at McDonald's <laughs> in a carton? What the? F- I was so I like, dude. And they, oh, man, you guys, they mentioned the milk mouth. They're like, it makes mucus, and I was gagging. I was like, oh. <laughs> I can't do milk. I just, I have this weird version and I can't stand it. And this book knew. And you know what I'm thinking too? I wonder if so much of my aversion to milk is because I read this book first when I was like 10 or 12 and was like, oh, that sounds disgusting. These descriptions are really gross because there was another description of her really tough feet that I was like, oh, "Oh." (laughs) he was like, I don't, I don't, I didn't mark it, but it was like, he was amazed by the toughness of the calluses of her feet. I literally was like, like, (laughs) and like, the other mention of milk is like Ray is chugging a carton of milk before the race. And I'm just like, you are a disgusting human being. Please go away. (laughs) I just don't get it. Like why there's, so many other things that you could be drinking, Christopher Pike. Please, please never do this to me again. <laughs> Just drink a Gatorade and get a Coca-Cola from McDonald's. Like, yes. stop it. I I didn't even know that McDonald's served milk. Like, <laughs> Gross. I, I was more um, going off of, like, I was thinking that maybe they would, like, bring up the uh, high C orange. Just because, like, that's, like, a product of, like, the times of McDonald's, uh-huh. you know? <laughs> It'll way better hard. drink. Yeah, no, you're not wrong. It goes better with chicken nuggets, to be sure. Um, Okay, so do we have any more notes on the overall plot discussion? Any more thoughts on things that happened there? The other thing that I thought was going to go further is that it's only mentioned one time that at the bottom of the falls is a, um, what are they, a whirlpool? And I'm like, Mm. does that mean it goes somewhere? I thought it was going to be some sort of weird portal to somewhere or they were going to do something with it, but it just... Once again, it's another thing that's, you know, kind of peppered in, but doesn't pay off in the end. So it was, I don't know, it was weird things like that. I was, my adult brain from reading, you know, bigger novels, I always kept thinking like, okay, this is going to become important later on. Like, remember this point. And I would like write it down and I'd I'd be ready for it to come back. And then it's just like, nope, uh, she just closes her eyes and basically they they switch with with a parrot. (laughs) So, yeah, that's where we're going here. That part where she just closes her eyes, that was so funny because I was like, wait, she just, she basically just blinked and now she wins. (laughs) And um, I don't know if you guys want to go over the end right now. Yeah, sure. Um, So does does anyone else find it so strange that um, Cindy would just stroll up to the falls with like her... (laughs) or <laughs> beast master like look with <laughs> a parrot on the shoulder and a wolf and i'm just like what is going on here i know she's like no fear she's just like i'm gonna get this bitch like here we go she does not care about anything she doesn't even tell people like 
she, there's no safety. Like, what? She could have called the cops. She could have done something. And it's not like Bala like told her how to do this. She was just like, yeah, I think this will work. <laughs> so, right, this thing that his grandfather had to train him to do, like this thing that his his grandfather's teaching his father, right? And then his father died because he was like doing it wrong, and he's fighting fighting with spirits and stuff. And then she's just like, ah, I've got this. I'll wing it. Like <laughs> that was the most like. I know that it's like a product of his times and everything, but like this, just the white entitlement yeah. <laughs> to me was like, oh my God, like, okay, girl, you do you, I guess. Good luck. Well, and they build Joni up to be like this superhuman creature that can like overtake people like Bala and like um, overtake people like Ray and overtake. And then she's threatened by like a dog wolf and that like scares her. I, I totally thought she was just going to straight up kill the dog. You know what I mean? Are vultures afraid of dogs? Like, in is that like a, a bird? Like, I don't know. I've never been around a vulture, <laughs> but if that's a thing, maybe that maybe Freak knew if that was a thing. Cause I, I thought that too. I was like, why is she scared of the dog? She killed Bala or like, she almost killed Bala. Like why kill the dog? Like you could, I don't want her to kill the dog, obviously, but <laughs> She would just kill the dog. Like, what's going on? I feel like Pike could have, like, slipped in that little fact, though, if he knew of something like that, wouldn't he? So that, like, people would understand. (laughs) Maybe, yeah. I don't know. Because then they they had mentioned that she didn't like fire, so I thought that was going to go somewhere, too. But then they were, like, and they were cuddled around the fire. And I was like, oh, I guess not. I was like, why are you bringing this stuff up if you're not going to use it? You know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah, This is just like where this book this time around failed for me for a little bit is it, it does such a good job of like building up to this huge crescendo of an ending. And you're like, oh, shit, it's going down. We're going into the final countdown, the final everything. And then it just is done. And you're like, wait, so, sh- oh, OK, I guess she won. All right. Moving on. Epilogue. <laughs> like. <laughs> It is a very quiet victory. Like I wasn't, I wasn't even actually sure what had happened because until they explained that Sybil again, they had to explain it to me again because I'm so stupid that she was blind. And so she was trapped in there now. I was like, oh, oh, I see. That didn't even dawn on me until like they had to spell it out for me because I'm so like dense. And I was like, I don't understand. I know. I was like, what is going? I, okay, fair. That's fair. That's fair. (laughs) Out of my back. Um, But I was just like, she can just get out of the bird now. Why are you keeping that bird? Kill that bird. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know why she doesn't kill the bird. Like, I I mean, I realize that maybe she has like, no, she doesn't even have sentimentality for the bird because the bird won't even say her name. They, you know, they mention that many, many times throughout the book. And, you know, this is the one, you know, the blindness of the bird. I, I will be totally honest with you until they mentioned it again. It was the one thing that he took to like make the ending interesting that I just completely forgot about. <laughs> <laughs> It's a it, yeah. It was. It wasn't the most um, explosive ending, I will say, <laughs> in comparison to some of his others. Um, I mean, I like the idea of the of the the creature being trapped and everything. I like that the girl won. Like my, I I always like it when the good guys win. But I wish she could have killed her. I wish it was a little bit more brutal. I think like her body flying off of the mountain and into the whirlpool would have maybe been better. Yeah. <laughs> I, I totally agree. And it would make the um, the mysterious ending that much more um, scary that they're like, is Joni out there or is she not? You know what I mean? Like they yeah, never find it, the body. That, that type of an ending I think would have been now. better. Yeah, I agree. Totally agree. Okay. So, Becca, do you have anything else on plot discussion? I do not know. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with more of the PikeCast. Friends, where else can you get this kind of programming than the Pikecast? Nowhere, that's where. But we're trying to keep the lights on here. If you like what you're hearing and want it to keep happening, jump over to our Patreon at thepikecast.com slash Patreon and throw us a few bucks to join our private Discord server. Higher tiers get books, stickers, bookmarks, and even personalized shirts. That's thepikecast.com slash Patreon. Once, Osgood and Frost were the up-and-coming stars of the burgeoning paranormal investigation TV show craze before a hoax put an end to their friendship, partnership, and television careers. 
Now, over a decade later, Prudence Osgood is a barely functioning alcoholic ghost hunter for hire. Her yearning for mystery and adventure is reignited when she receives a cryptic, untraceable email. She can't resist embarking on an investigation that tugs threads, winding through a sinister series of disappearances, her former partner's family, and a night 20 years ago when a semi blew a yellow light and nearly killed her. Reviewers are calling Osgood as Gone a masterfully vulnerable and relatable 21st century horror story and a bourbon-soaked supernatural mystery with sparkling dialogue that sticks the landing on LGBT characters and main character Prudence Osgood, as tortured as she is clever, broken in all the best ways, and a true heroine for our times. Buy it today at As Good As Gone as a paperback, ebook, or audiobook narrated by me, JJ Ronvier. Welcome back to the podcast. Now we're heading into the eternal enemy. So, what are our thoughts on the antagonist, which is Joni in this case? I mean, overall, I think Joni, uh, it's complicated because, you know, we're led to believe that she is kind of like the good girl, but secretly she harbingers a, a demonic force in the, in, in, in the uh, entity of a vulture. And um, it was just so strange. Um, but ultimately, I still think um, she was a good villain in that she could lure people in. And I liked that she could hold a spell over people. And I'm, I'm always there for having a female villain. It also it oh, always yes. makes me really happy. So I, I, overall, I think Joni's a great character. I think I wish we could have gotten a little bit more um, visceralness from her in the end. I was hoping that the Cindy... Uh, Joni showdown was going to be a little bit more um, catastrophic. Like, are we, is Cindy going to live or die? But I never feel like she's in trouble at any point. Mm -hmm. Um, So she's not as powerful as I wanted her to be, but still overall, I enjoyed the character of Joni. I agree. Yeah. I think, I think she was a little bit more passive than I would have liked, but she still had that dangerous, like scary thing about her that made her a good villain. Like, Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't want to be in, like, a room alone with that girl. <laughs> yeah. She's terrifying. You know what would have made it a bit cooler would be the fact that Pike already talks about, like, grizzly bears because that's what they assume is doing it. Why, going back to, like, when you guys were talking about, like, the vulture, like, why was it a vulture? Why the hell is it not a grizzly bear? <laughs> yeah. So I feel like, I so from the vulture perspective, I can kind of understand because, like, as a creature, vultures are, like, they're just constantly wanting like they want Mm. other things and they want to feast on dead things and to kill things like so that they can eat more. And like, I think that a lot of, obviously I'm no vulture specialist, but (laughs) I just, (laughs) I just feel like their, um, their purpose to life seems more about eating and killing and survival than a bear, which has other things like they care for their young and they do. And I don't know, maybe vultures do too, but I feel like bears are a little bit more closely, related to people and vultures are a little less if that makes sense Mm -hmm. i don't know just to me that's how i thought about it yeah if she were a bear that seems less scary to me but a vulture i'm like oh god get her away yeah i can definitely see that because like i think um if i'm remembering correctly like vultures they don't they don't stop like they're constantly like insatiable like they can't Mm -hmm. like they can't be full enough So I think that was an interesting take on it. It kind of falls flat. um, And I think Becca, maybe while you're alluding to it as being a different animal is because like, what would you gain from putting a human into a vulture and then coming back from it? Because we learned that, you know, um, Bala has been a fish and Bala has been Mm -hmm. other things that like contribute to his character and give him new strength and new abilities. And it was almost like the shaman was like, Oh, white girl doesn't believe me. Well, here you go. Here's a vulture bitch. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Yeah. I I felt that way too, which I, I mean, it's an extreme way to get her to really like come to your side of things if it had worked out, I guess. Yeah. (laughs) I just I feel like you should have put more planning in there. That poor girl. Like I just thinking about her perspective of things, like her story is so much shorter, but how horrific. Like to not to not believe and then to have something like that happen, to be inside that sort of headspace where like you're saying they're constantly wanting, constantly just like devouring, and then 
to seek like solace to look for your parents and then to have them shoot you in the face when you find them like I I don't know why that sticks with me so much but I just picture this bird girl like mama daddy and then they're just like bam yeah. why were they eating lunch with a gun anyway can you tell me that what the heck I don't know <laughs> <laughs> It was weird. Okay, but I think we're we're unanimously like we like Joni. We wish she would have been a little bit more, but we were we were okay with her. Yeah. Honestly, on top of what you just said, like I feel like there is a lot to sympathize with her and to feel bad for. Her. And I kind of wish that it was like more put I don't know how to explain what I'm trying to say, but like more like like I didn't think about those things while reading the book, but with you repeating what had happened to her and how sad it is, like that really makes her such a good character to me for the fact that she does have this like backstory of like her life kind of fucking sucks. <laughs> yeah. And like, so think about the vulture too, this poor vulture, like, not, you know, poor, but like he's up in the sky, like doing his own <laughs> business. And then he gets put into a girl's body and is that like catatonic suck. and has no idea. Like just from, from both ends of this, like these, this didn't need to happen. <laughs> like yeah. these poor things like, Oh, it's so sad. This I, story is bad. I did think it was interesting though. Like when it, it's explaining kind of how Joni is taking over um, Cindy at the end and she's kind of seeing like three different universes, like the mm -hmm. perspective or it's almost like the memories of these three different, it's like her memories, it's the vultures memories and it's Joni's memories. And I'm like, so how much of Joni is really left? Like I wish that they would have, given me a little more in that headspace because I was finding it really hard to sympathize with her because she just like literally was tearing people apart and she couldn't besides knowing that she has like a vulture inside of her but they don't ever give you like what did that do to her psyche you know what I mean mm -hmm. yeah so from okay so this i think way too much into things so obviously i was very taken by joni the girl and the vulture in the story so what i thought what i was thinking is that joni is gone and so there i don't i know they keep hinting like maybe there's part of her left i don't think that's her i think that's her memories and her like everything she believed everything she thought all of her the thoughts in her head but how they mentioned that there's a sheath that separates the thoughts from the spirit i think her spirit is gone and then her thoughts are there. So the vulture spirit is inside of her, but doesn't have that sheath. And then once it starts taking it from other people, it starts connecting more with the human memories. So it starts becoming this like hybrid. So it's, I see what you're saying about like, how does that affect her? But then also I'm like, how does that, how is that affecting the vulture? Like, no wonder it's fucking murderous and crazy. Like it, it's given more power than it had ripped from what it knew and then on top of that, it has all these things like morals and thoughts and feelings now that it doesn't know how to handle because vultures are not meant for that. So like, oh, what a fucking hellish experience. Right? <laughs> like, it's so awful. Like, I don't know if Christopher Pike really put the thought. Maybe he did. And I, I don't want to discredit him. But like if he sat there thinking like this is truly terrifying, what a horrible thing to happen to a human being because it really is. And I think that's why this one affects me and why it's stuck with me so much over the years. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, we're kind of led to believe that, like, you would think that um, Joni, the person, would have been like an awful person or something. And that's why this happened to her. But it's really led to believe that she's just like kind of this like timid young girl. And yeah. it she has no qualities that make you like want her to get it in the end. Do you know what I mean? So when mm -hmm. she does become this creature, it's just that much more tragic, especially, you know, given what we've talked about, that she gets killed by her own parents. Like it's it's such an awful existence that you're just like, damn, you really hate Joni. <laughs> like, yes. Yes, that's what I – what did Joni do to you, Pike? Come on. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think I – so I'm I'm solidly on the side of just I really like this this bad guy and this villain just as a whole. The vulture, I like the vulture Joni creature that's not, not fully Joni, not fully vulture. Like I just – it's so unique and weird and cool. Yeah, it's definitely super unique. I had never – read anything kind of like with transference of spirits between animals and humans and uh, it, it was like i was like wow he this is not because usually in his books if we're being totally honest you know there's been supernatural stuff in some of them but usually it's people on people like violence you know what i mean it's not this spiritual take that he takes in this book so to me spellbound's like one of his more unique stories mm-hmm yeah, I agree. I agree. And I, I think 
when people go into Christopher Pike thinking like, oh, teen thrillers, like murder and horror and stuff like that, when they, when they get to ones like this, they're like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> it's kind of out of left field. You're like, wait a minute. <laughs> and I love it. I'm like, stick around. There's so much of this. It's random. I love it. <laughs> um, okay. So let's go into the thirst section, which um, this is titillation and sexuality in Pike's world for the book. Um, there was... I, we've touched a little bit on this. There was that one sort of almost rape scene that I did not like. Um, and there was a lot of wanting yeah. <laughs> on the parts of the characters. <laughs> there's a lot of male gaze in this book. Um, yes. But there's also like some female gaze too, which is interesting because yeah. Cindy is kind of, you know, wavering between throughout the entire book. This girl cannot make up her mind about anything, which drives me insane. <laughs> she yeah. it seems like she would be the kind of girlfriend that you would be like, well, where do you want to go for dinner? And she'd be like, I don't know. Where do you want to go? And it's just like, oh, God. I don't know. Do they serve milk? That's where I want to go. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, the one that I pointed out earlier was just the sexily eating a hot dog, which is just ridiculous. Yeah, that 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 made me laugh. Like, I was like, "How do you do?" And I honestly, I tried picturing myself eating a hot dog, and I was like, "This is probably one of the least sexy foods I could eat." Like, I don't know how. What I get, I, maybe he was just like, "Oh, because it's phallic shape," but I'm like, "You're biting it off." Yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> We can't forget the fact that he called it a wiener instead of a hot dog. (laughs) And that drove me fucking insane. (laughs) It did kind of make me want a hot dog, though. I won't lie. Uh, No, this conversation between McDonald's and and, and hot dogs. Now I'm like, hmm, what's for lunch? (laughs) (laughs) But I will say in this book, besides, you know, our one, you know, big scene where Jason and Cindy kind of have their their thing and then the pl- the time between Alex and Joni when they're on the when, uh, they're on his parents couch and I'm like dude they could walk in at any moment so you need to <laughs> just slow your roll there's not as much in this book f- at least from when I remember um reading Christopher Pike as a young kid I remember there being a lot more thirsty moments in some of his other books this one was a little more tame if I'm being totally honest I agree yeah I I think this one was a little bit less focused on the sex and more focused on like the spiritual sort of like animal shenanigans which i thought was cool yeah it was more about like the want rather than the action yeah yeah and when there was action it was kind of like <laughs> we don't want this action to be happening it was definitely on. Cringy. <laughs> yeah yeah it was i was yeah i was like what how is she not punching him in the face <laughs> like what the heck ah uh, yeah so well this is a quick section yeah. <laughs> Becca, do you have anything to say about the thirst section no not really i feel like a lot of the lines that um like for the want that is that can be found in the book a lot of it came from Murray that i noticed there's this one line where he's like well when alex says this class can be a lot of fun and Ray agrees by saying biology always is his sexual innuendo going right by Joni. And I have to let you guys know that that sexual innuendo also went right by me. <laughs> <laughs> like I did Wait. not get it at first until they were like, I don't, huh? I don't know. I don't get it. I mean, I think just because like biology and like sex, I don't, I don't like, like human like, biology. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Ooh, he was trying to be sexy with that. I don't like it. <laughs> Yeah, like honestly, if it didn't add his sexual innuendo going right by Joni, I would have never got that it was a sexual innuendo at all. I don't but know. I guess he's also really very naive. Science. So, yeah. Huh? <laughs> yeah, this one didn't have a lot of that stuff in it. Um, yeah, and I will say, like Ray as a character is kind of he's thirsty for like everybody because he basically any any person that he hasn't asked out, he like feels compelled to ask out. And I'm just like, dude, come on, like you're such a cringer. Yeah. Like, how many times could you get rejected before you stop doing this? Please. <laughs> right. Right. He's like, I want to be back with Pam, but I also want to get Joni in the sack. Like, he literally says in the sack at some point. Gross. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was really gross. He's like, I want to know what that white skin feels oh my God, under I my fingertips. I'm like, dude, what? Ew, Ugh. you're creeping. I don't like it. Like, please take your fingertips elsewhere, okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he just, as a character, seems like he'd have, like, greasy hands all the time. So yes. I'm just like, like he's just constantly covered in sweat and yeah. like he doesn't wash properly. I don't know. Just he's got nothing. like crumbs in the corner of his mouth, like that yes. kind of a guy. 
fucking owl feathers and shit. I get the vibe that he's, like, the type of guy who will DM you, and then when you turn him down, he'll be like, well, you're a fat bitch anyway. Like, those are the exactly. vibes I got from Ray. Yeah. He did give me those vibes, too. Yeah. We're not a huge Ray fan. <laughs> okay. So, heading into Die Softly, moralizing and problematic elements in the writing. Um, I know we touched on, like, the magical black eye thing, which... Mm-hmm it's a trope that's been done it's not it's not it's not a good trope um mm. i i think they leaned really heavily into that here especially because he was from africa and stuff um but again it's it's from 88 it is what it is a lot of pike's books that we read have things like this in it that were just like i don't think this would be written today yeah and you just got to kind of take it as it is i mean i will say in as soon as the character of bala was introduced i was like oh no like is there stuff in here that i do not remember that is going to be real bad nowadays but i will say like he for an 88 book young adult book he doesn't take it as far as i thought he was going to so i think that there was some restraint put into that and it did feel like he at least put in the effort of giving bala a very like well-rounded background and we knew like about his village we knew about his family we knew about his grandfather so at least as a character while written a white man written you know re- writing a black character at least he did give him a well-rounded background you know what i mean yeah yeah, no, I do definitely get that. And I think that's something that we've mentioned too. And I don't remember which book or episode it was, but it it was something that we were like, I feel like this wasn't at, handled as well as it would have been today. But I also feel like he tried. He was trying to put a character in here who was not just white and make them fleshed out and well-rounded as the other characters um, with, you know, a couple of missteps that are understandable for the times. And it's, it's not even like, it's not him being hateful or anything like that, like the missteps. It's just like, little things that you're like we know better than to use these words now or to say these things now and things like that so exactly it happens um i have the one the only like other small little problematic thing it's not even truly problematic honestly i mean it is but it so uh she was a head shorter than cindy and her backside was chunky she also had a big nose Yet Pam somehow avoided being a dog, and cindy thought it was because she always seems so ready for a good time she was not all talk not when it came to sex so this is something that we see a lot where it's like a chunky character is seen as being unattractive, but she puts out. So she's right. okay. And that just Oof. always like rubs me the wrong way. And it's in a lot of books. And uh, again, product of its time. It's just, it, it is one of those things that we see a lot that I'm just like, look, she could be chunky and not put out if she wants. And she's still fine. Like right. <laughs> she, yeah. it, it's just that thing. It, it always, I always notice that in his books now. And it, it's something that I didn't notice as a kid, but I feel like I probably without knowing it subconsciously, maybe internalized some of that as like, Oh, if I'm flirtatious, but I'm chunky, like it's okay. People will still like me. They'll ignore my fat for my fun, frivolous nature, you know, like, yeah. I don't know. So I think that's just something to mention in the problematic section. Well, it's that, it's that thing that like, you, you know, you can be fat, but if you have a, if you have a good personality, then you're still, you're still okay. You know what I mean? And that that's kind of like where we get a lot of our self shame from, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because ultimately being fat is bad, which the ultimate sin, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. For a teenager, you cannot be fat. Like there's, you don't exist if you're fat, you know, and that's really problematic. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And and yeah. And then then it's just something to mention. Obviously, it's, it's, it's something that is in other books. It's not something only he's guilty of. It's in movies. It's in things. It's it's something that we still see today. So just a little something. Um, Do you guys have any other problematic or bad things in there? I think we addressed everything that I noticed from like the rapey scene mm-hmm. to the ra- well, the magical black man, um, and what you just talked about. I think I think that's pretty much what I've noticed. Yeah, a lot of it comes from like the unwanted sexual advances and how he writes those scenes is just like, oh god, like, right. but but they honestly they're so true to life though. Like they it's are. always yeah. like this. It's always like, no, no, no. And then they kind of back off for a little bit and then they try to initiate, you know, the, the, I think he calls them like the hungry kisses or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just like, yeah, this, I can see this happening. This is true to life, but this is why as a society, we have to kind of start to look at those things a lot more, not a lot harder and, you know, mm-hmm. talk about them and, call them out when they're ha- when they happen because it's not so, no person should be in fear of unwanted sexual advances 
For sure. Absolutely. And I, and I think um, to his credit in this as well, I remember there was, a, I don't have the exact quote or the page marked, but when that was happening in the scene, I remember, I thought it was so interesting that um, Cindy thinks like it's easier to go along with the kisses instead of fighting it. Um, because that is such a true, like, I, there have been so many times where I've been on dates or like with a guy that I was dating or something that I felt like uh, it'll be just easier, you know, to kiss back or to do this, even if I'm not super into the mood. Um, and I thought it was it it was really important to show that and to acknowledge that for him in such a book, like from this time for this age range, and then also have her put her foot down and say like, no, like I'm not, I don't want this and to step away from it and, you know, get herself out of the situation, which obviously not every time you can get yourself out of the situation. So that's not me saying that you know, she should have or anything like that. But I just, I thought it was good that they showed that she didn't just go along with it. So that for a little teen me reading this, like I read that and, you know, it's something good to keep in mind. That's not just like, okay, you have to do this because people are telling you to. Yeah. I was glad she stood up for herself in the end. Me too. And I was, I was also glad he didn't get more bad. I, I wanted Jason to die this whole book. So. <laughs> yeah, honestly, same. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I was so. hoping that he would accompany Cindy up to the falls at the end and be the one that got killed. Yeah. Because they killed so many other people. Why couldn't Joni have just done a quick little eh, and gotten him? But I think he wasn't like obsessed with her. So she wouldn't have really fed off of him was I think the thing too. Yeah. Stupid. He should have been. He was dumb. He could have just been obsessed like everybody else. <laughs> she was a pretty girl. <laughs> All right, so heading into the season of passage. So this is Cooper's favorite section, and Becca and I usually don't have a whole bunch of um, stuff highlighted just because when I read, I don't highlight a lot of stuff unless it stands out to me. Like I don't look for stuff to highlight, so I, I don't usually have a lot of those. But do you have anything highlighted, Becca or Andrew? I do. Ooh, I good, good. Like, good. You've got some. Yeah, I have two things. Well, I Hang had on. three, but the wiener was one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I'm sorry. Just so we're clear, was the wiener under the best or worst writing? Oh, worse. <laughs> oh. <yeah. laughs> so another worst line that I have is Pam made a face, which was easy for her to do with the sort of face she had. Like, what the fuck does that mean? Oh, what? I missed that line when I was reading it. Yeah. I. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Um, and then another one I have is like not necessarily good writing or bad writing, but more like um bad bitch energy, you know. So we have um I don't even actually remember what scene this is. Oh, Cindy talking to Bala about how to get rid of Joni, and she was like, "I don't want your prayers. You're a shaman's grandson. I want magic. I want to know how I can waste this bitch." And just the waste this bitch part, I really enjoyed. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> The one that really stuck out, like stood out to me, and I'm I'm a book purist, so I never make marks in my books, but um, <laughs> I, I did find it is um, the when it's right after um, Alex and Joni hang out for the first time, and he has that dream at the end of the chapter, and I'll just read the very end of it. Um, and he watched, feeling a great horror because the feeding animals filled him with envy. The sight of bloody carcasses were making him hungry. Yes, he had changed like that. The whole description of the dream is really dreamlike and very descriptive. And it kind of caught me off guard because it, it if you read the whole passage going back now, it kind of tells you the end of the book in in the dream because yeah. it's he's he has a dream that he's in the river and he goes over the falls and he floats. And so you're like, oh, this is like now going back. It's the end of the book. He foreseen what was going to happen to him. Oh, I didn't even, I didn't even connect to those things. I thought, I, I don't know why, but I thought like the river was like a metaphorical, like that was how the vultures were being born or something. I don't know. Like, <laughs> I don't know what I thought. I thought it was like they were being born of like a river of blood and like shot out into the sky. And <laughs> I know that's not how vultures are really made, but I was like, I don't know. I don't know. It was a dream. So I was just like, yeah, but your way makes so much more sense. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and another God. thing about the river, too, th you would think <laughs> after all the things that happen in this river, that they, they would stay away from it after a while, but they <laughs> just keep going back no matter how many times people fall in. It's her hunting ground. You know, I for as many times as they mention the river, I don't know why, like, they go into the river so many times and they mention the whirlpool, but they don't, there's no there's no connection between the two. Like I thought like, Oh, we're going to go over the cliffs and then I'll be sucked into the whirlpool and die. But like, they don't mention the whirlpool again. It was just the cliffs and the, the waterfall and stuff. 
Yeah. It remind it honestly reminded me, I know we'll bring it up again, but it reminded me of Jennifer's body because in that movie there is a whirlpool that they are that I think that they throw the knife that they use to stab Jennifer in and it they it goes nobody knows where it goes. Like there's a whole scene in that where scientists are putting like golf balls or something down it and they're trying to figure out where it goes and they never figure it out. I wanted it to be something like that. I'm going to have to rewatch that because I, I watched it when I was like 17. I remember really liking it, but I don't remember it. And I've seen so many people recently talking about it because of, you know, just like feminism and stuff and like how good it is. And I was like, I better rewatch this shit. I got to watch this girl like be a badass in this I'm movie so again because I don't remember this. Have you I seen think... it recently, Becca? Oh, yeah, kind of. I think I watched it around Halloween again. Oh, okay. So you're, but you're I'm going to watch it tonight now. So along with the <laughs> staircase. <laughs> it's it, it's yeah. an interesting movie. Watching it now and seeing how much. Um, a female on female hate there is in that movie is is problematic now they just like they tease each other relentlessly in that movie and it's just like man i don't think teenage girls are this mean to each other but i don't remember i say i don't i don't remember it very well at all i remember um like i remember megan fox remember being like oh she looks like great in this movie this is awesome she's like Mm -hmm. murderous and like evil and that's really the only thing that i I don't even remember how it ends so i I'm going to go into it basically blind, which is cool. <laughs> Check out. Okay, so do we have any – I know that we mentioned um, for pikeisms. We mentioned McDonald's. Um, I'm going to add the milk mouth thing as a pikeism because why do so many yes. people in his books drink milk? Like <laughs> we don't need that. Um, do, were there any other things that you guys noticed that pop up in a lot of Pike's books or just things that he uses a lot? I think the one thing that stood out to me was the dis- how he how he always describes characters is always consistent across. It's always like, here's our character and here's their most prominent point of their uh, like what they look like and here's why they are the way they are. Like he always explains his characters the exact same way in every book. Yeah, I've noticed that too. I've noticed a lot of our um, our main girls are usually uh, thin and very pretty, and they eat a lot of food and don't gain a pound and they're either too thin and they wish they were more curvy or they have a nose that's a little bit too big for their face. <laughs> a shade too large is I think what he says a lot of the times about it. Um, and, and, and there are, you know, and that, that's something that comes because like, how many different ways could you describe people? I guess, you know, when you're writing this many books, you're putting this many out in a year. Um, but there are also other similarities like the chunky friend who's a little bit sassy, um, the, the jockey type of guy that the girl's super into, um, there's always usually a, a nicer guy, which in this one is her brother, Alex. So I think that he has like these basic holes that he's like, okay, plug this one in here. Mm-hmm. Plug this one in here. We've got this one. Um, and then sometimes I just believe he just goes through like a list of names, like baby name books. And he's just like blindly putting his finger like up and down. He's like this one, this one, this one. <laughs> um, and I, I mean, I'm here for it. I like the books. I love, I love the character. So it's, it's fun, but they are when you read them consistently back to back, especially you do start noticing a lot of these similarities. Yeah. The only other thing that I was going to mention is the dramatic recovery from injuries. (laughs) Like (laughs) everyone gets like beat up and, you know, tossed in the river and goes over the waterfalls and Bala gets his arm broken in half, but they all just recover just fine. You know? (laughs) Yeah. Very, very speedy and a little bit of Wolverine in all of them. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So we're going to head into last act. And so if you're familiar with this. This is where we're going to rate it. Um, we're going to do out of five pikes. And um, as you probably know, we can sometimes throw things onto the pike or have something in there that we want to add as a little boost to our rating. So, Andrew, why don't you go ahead first and tell us your rating for this book? I'm going to give Spellbound four pikes with maybe a chicken nuggie on the side. <laughs> yes, chicken nuggies. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> oh, I, think so excited. I think it's like a really um, unique story, especially for Christopher Pike. I think it has some holes that that um, that lead me to not be able to give it a perfect score. But rereading it again, I was just reminded how um, easy it was to read and how entertaining it was. So I can't go below, uh, you know, a four. I see. I gotcha. Becca, what about you? I'm going to give it three vulture attacked bodies. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, how do I word this without making it sound like the vulture is like the decapitate? Er, never mind. Forget me. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just rambling. Um, I actually, I really like, I liked it. Um, 
Yeah. I feel like there was a lot of, like, random things that didn't necessarily need to be in it. Like, we mentioned the cross country. He really he really missed his shots a few times throughout the book. Um, But, like, I really was kind of vibing with the whole, like, shaman-type backstory. And, I guess, the Megan Fox, Jennifer body comparison. So, three bodies attacked by vultures. <laughs> <laughs> we love it. Yes. Um, and then I am going to give it... I think I'm going to give it four pikes with a sexily eaten hot dog. <laughs> oh, sorry. A sexily eaten wiener <laughs> thrown on the last one for a little bit extra uh, to boost it kind of to four and a half. Um, I think when I was younger, I gave this one a five, but then rereading it now as an adult, there are those holes that we all talked about and mentioned. Um, that said, still, I I cannot tell you how affected I am by this poor girl in the vulture. Like, that's just the most horrific, tragic, like, I... I I know it's not something that like happens and I know it's not real, but I'm just like, man, my heart, poor Joni. She just wanted her parents and they were having lunch and I just, I'll never forget it. So it gets close to five for me. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. The, this is, he didn't pull any punches with Joni. <laughs> Let's just say that. No, no. <laughs> All right. So. Andrew, why don't you tell our listeners about where we can find you online? Sure. Um, I, on my personal account, I really only have a Facebook. Um, I have an Instagram that's long not been put on anything. But uh, if you want to follow Friday the 13th Horror Podcast, uh, we are a podcast that talks all about horror in real life and then ties it back to the movies that it is inspired by. Um, and we are on all the social medias. On um, You can search for us on Facebook and on Instagram and Twitter. You can search for us at, at Friday 13. Uh, yeah, come come, give us a listen to the podcast is a ton of fun. And um, I'm really happy that I was able to come on and get my feet wet with a with a Pike book again. Oh, we're so happy that you could yes. be here. It was, it was really fun talking about the book with you. I love when we I mean, I love all our guests, but I love especially when we have guests that have such a rich history with the book and with Christopher Pike. Cause then there's like, there's just so much more that we can ask about it. And mm -hmm. it's really fun for me as a longtime fan. Um, Becca, why don't you tell us where we can find you online? Okay. So I have a blog where I mostly talk about books. You can find that at as told by Bex .com. Um, I'm on Twitter also at as told by Bex and I have an Instagram where I mostly just show books and that's read with Bex. Awesome. And then you can find me. My blog is letsgetgalactic.com. And then I am on Instagram and Twitter as at control alt Cassie. So like on your keyboard, control alt and then C-A-S-S-I-E, my name. And then you can also find stuff in my Etsy shop, which is shop letsgetgalactic.com. Well, you guys oh, will then, have to definitely have me back for when Cooper is back because I'd love to do another episode um, with yeah, him as well. We will, for sure. I was going to ask. Um, we we have things currently booked out to June, June, I think. Um, I think so. Yeah, it's it's quite a far. It's quite a bit in advance. Um, and we're currently just trying to balance things because we had been going um, back to back to back for a while and for all of us just with everything in the pandemic it's been like kind of a lot so yeah we're trying to make sure i, I definitely can understand and i know i know that life <laughs> it's hard because you, you think you're like oh i'm at home i can do this it's like podcast stuff from home but then it, it's work it is it is work and mm -hmm. it, it when you have a lot of it um it yeah but yeah we would definitely love to have you back um so for any of our listeners listening <laughs> the yeah sorry <laughs> For any listeners listening. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Um, for our listeners, you can follow us on social media. We are The Pikecast on Twitter, Instagram. Um, we do have a Facebook page as well. You can follow us on any of your preferred listening apps for podcasts. We really appreciate it if you could leave us a review if you like what you're hearing. Um, and then we also have a Patreon. And you can find us at patreon.com slash The Pikecast. And that helps us pay for things like this service that we use to record and transcription. Um, and if you're a member of our Patreon, you also get early access to our episodes and there are certain physical rewards that go out that are Pikecast themed. So your homework for next time is going to be the book, Remember Me. And we have Grady Hendricks coming on our next episode to talk about that one with us. So we're excited. We can't wait to see you guys. Thank you again, Andrew, so much for being here. Oh, thank you guys so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. <laughs> and thank you, Becca, for co-hosting this with me. Um, and just a shout out to Cooper for everything that he does in keeping this thing running because this is not easy. <laughs> it's a lot of work. So um, he'll be back with us soon. And we appreciate you guys sticking around. Thank you. Woo. You survived the night, friends. 
you can peek out from under your covers and see the first blues of dawn out the window. Thanks for spending the night with the Pikecast, and we hope you'll join us again next time. Until then, Pikers, pleasant dreams. Um, Becca, do you want to ask the next one? Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, was just, I was really entranced by you guys talking. Just <laughs> I'm, I'm so worried. Am I? So I talk really fast, and I'm trying, like, I'm trying to be aware of that and slow down when I do podcasts. But it is so hard for me. <laughs> so, oh, if I'm going totally too fast, fine. just tell me. Okay, good. <laughs>